Welcome everybody um, to our final Zoom talk for 2020. Um, we are joined tonight by Vishnu Prahalad and he's going to be talking to us about sustainable systems and the promise of MMT. And I think from his beautiful Zoom background, you can get an idea of um, a love of nature, um, which we all share. Um, so before we start, um, I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to First Nations people on whose stolen land we live and work, wherever we are in Australia, um, we are on Aboriginal land. Acknowledge their wisdom in caring for the land and the grief that they feel as their country suffers the effects of climate change and global warming, which is a product of colonisation. Also acknowledge the important role that First Nations people play in the fight for climate justice. Um, I'm on Ghana land here in Adelaide, um, many of us are. If, you're, um, if you know the land that you're on and you'd like to put it in the chat, that would be a nice acknowledgement if you're able to. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Vishnu. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and we're really looking forward to what you have to say. Thanks, Gabby. I'll start sharing my screen in a minute. And while I'm doing that, I am from Lutruwita, Tasmania. Perfect. Ready when you are, thank you. Okay, yep, I'll just <laughs> get my timer started so I'll give a sense of how long I'm going for, yep. Thanks, uh, Gabby. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks to Stephen, too, for, for his invitation to join your group. And uh, ever since I've heard about your group, I've been very excited about uh, uh, what you might potentially be doing in this space. So it's a great opportunity to participate in one of your forums and participate especially as a, as a speaker for the first time. So hopefully I'll, I'll try to listen into some of the talks coming up uh, next year. And I am new to MMT and uh, some of what I'll be presenting today uh, will be a no, sort of an open conversation about MMT and how it is to uh, systems and some of the work that we're doing here. Uh, so start here. Uh, with the first slide, I'll, I'll, a brief outline of the talk is I'll, I'll go through a, a bit of an introduction to myself, what I do, and, and how I got involved in all of that I'm presenting today. And then um, the talk is effectively in two parts. Um, I'll talk about sustainable systems, and throughout that, I'll make reference to MMT wherever I can. And then I'll finish off with an open conversation about the role of MMT in this space. Uh, in, in, middle, uh, in the middle, I'll talk a little bit about scarcity multiplier, which is uh, a new take on J.K. Galbraith's dependence effect, uh, which you might remember from his Affluent Society 1958. So there's a paper that we're working on now. So I'll weave that into the narrative here. Uh, and I, I put this up uh, because, uh, you know, with MMT, you know, obviously we know there's a lot behind the debt and deficit disaster story. Uh, but for me, uh, even before I became aware of MMT, um, when I thought about debt and disa de deficit disaster, I always wanted to think about in the ec ecological context because they are the real resources at the end of the day. That's the planet that we live on. And that's what we should be most concerned about, the money that's a made up thing. Uh, and that being, being front and center of the debt, I was never comfortable with the idea and when I, when I found out about MMT, when I've learned about it, I've now found a language and a theory that, that speaks to me in that context. So there's a whole, a whole range of things uh, that adds to this view of mine in terms of destined deficit disaster. And I, I, I spend a lot of time in the field as an ecologist, and I see this uh, firsthand, and this is exhibit one here. Uh, what we're seeing here is uh, literally old growth in our coastal wetlands, and these are the biggest shrubs uh, we find in these coastal wetlands anywhere in the world, and they're completely being undermined by sea level rise. And again, this is one of the stories that we will probably never get to see on mainstream media, um, because it's all been boiled down to climate change and, and the politics behind it, and not so much in terms of how it is having an effect on the environment that we live on and, and, and the you know, consequent debt and deficit disaster that I get to see every time I go out into the environment. 
Um, so this is a bit of my introduction in one slide. I've got a bit of an eclectic background. I like to call myself a geographer. Uh, so I've been teaching uh, geography for the last 11 years, uh, both undergrad and postgrad. And a key uh, interest of mine in terms of teaching sustainable systems is food systems. I'm a keen gardener myself. I grew up in a farm in India. So I've, I've got the close connection with land and, and growing food. Um, so part of that, uh, recently since my PhD, I've been able to diversify and now I'm starting looking at uh, food systems. We've got some work that's currently being done on food systems in Hobart. Uh, so apart from my teaching, I've been um, uh, an active ecologist. Uh, that's, that's my training. So uh, my PhD is in ecology. Um, so I published widely in that field and uh, for my PhD, I did get a best PhD award from UTAS. So um, so that, that was good to ha have that really in-depth understanding of the ecology and, and obviously the planning and, and the management um, side where I was able to re relate that to the management and planning of the teaching as well. Uh, so, uh, while I was um, uh, out and about doing ecology over the last 10, 11 years, I've also been very active with uh, management agencies, uh, community engagement and so on. Uh, so published uh, a number of atlases and, and book, uh, published a saltmarsh book of, of plants in Tasmania. Uh, and all of that's been in an effort to engage the community in, in the natural environment around us. Uh, so I've also got the obligatory app. Everyone's got an app now, I've got mine. Um, and in, in all of this, um, um, in thinking about conservation, and this is where I got, got involved in, in politics and economics is that invariably, Conservation is a, is a deeply political activity. Um, I don't think many conservationists and ecologists recognize it clearly, I, I do. And in, in doing that, I've also been vocal about it, both on public media and also in, in writing about it, that conservation is a political activity and we need to understand the politics and the political ecology behind that. So if you wanna follow a bit more about my work, those are some links. So with that background, um, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, to the talk. So first I want to talk about sustainable systems. So I want to begin with uh, the idea of a system. So here I'm borrowing some of the content from my postgrad, postgrad course for which I use Thinking in Systems by Donald Meadows as, as a reader. Um, so Meadows describes the system as, as you can imagine as an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way that achieves something, be it a function, a service, or a purpose. So with that definition, we can look at a whole range of systems around us. And you know, I'm, I'm interested in gardens and gardening. So if you look at a forest garden, for example, uh, we can take that system and break it apart. Uh, and this is a simple breaking apart of a forest garden. So here, the various language that we use in systems thinking, uh, such as elements. So there are a whole range of elements here, and there are interconnections between the elements like pollination, carbon sequestration, um, nutrient cycling, so on. Uh, and from a subset of those elements and interconnections, we derive functions or services. An interesting um, thing to note there is uh, uh, I mentioned subset, and, and that subset is culturally determined. Um, that is, humans, given our cultural progression, historic cultural progression, can only understand a subset of what's happening around us. And over time, that understanding obviously expands. I think of carbon sequestration, for example. 20 years ago, we couldn't have perhaps imagined that as a, as a process that happens in our ecosystems. Uh, now we have millions of dollars exchanging hands uh, for that as an ecosystem service. Right? So it's an example in terms of how we have all these elements in our environment, all these interconnections, and a subset of that we define as function and service and to various extents, we have markets or non-market interactions for them. So uh, as we go further up in terms of the systems language, you can also start looking at hierarchies. Uh, so in this case, uh, there are all these layers. Um, Meadows likes to refer to it as stratified order. Uh, so there's an order here and it's stratified. As you can see, there's a shrub layer, there's a herbaceous layer, there's a soil layer, and, and there's a canopy layer. Um, and if the hierarchies are working together, then we get cooperation or optimization, system optimization, when everything's working together. 
but we've all probably been involved in family groups and organizations in our lives or, or maybe are currently involved, but that's not the case. And that's an insight there that when those hierarchies are not optimized, we get suboptimal performance uh, for the system as such. And my university is an example of that. You know, we've got all these hierarchies, but somehow they tend to not produce the best outcomes for everyone involved. Um, and then we have stocks, flows, and feedbacks. And for uh, the economists, uh, I don't have to talk much about it because uh, that's part of the economic jargon. Um, perhaps not so much the feedbacks in terms of uh, what Meadows calls the stabilizing or the reinforcing feedbacks. Again, the language is better here than just talking about positive and negative feedback. Uh, that's got a certain connotation, uh, but positive is just reinforcing and negative is stabilizing and feedbacks. Um, so with these system terms, and I get to encourage my students to think about all the systems around them, uh, and in this case, uh, even the unit or an organization that we are a part of, and think of, you know, what are the elements of that organization? What interconnections are there? What functions does it perform that we can recognize? Uh, is the hierarchies working? How can we improve the hierarchies, optimize out outcomes? And how can we think, so what are the stocks, what are the flows, and, and what are the feedbacks? Um, so once we establish this really basic understanding of systems, and then we can go even further, and this is where uh, ecological understanding has brought in an enriched systems understanding. So this is straight from ecology, uh, where we're looking at systems, and in systems we can, you know, they're made of different species, or in other, other words, elements. Uh, so when there are lots and lots of different species or elements, uh, there is increasing provision of that service or stability of ecological function, like pollination. Uh, but if more and more species drop off, and then if the bees drop off, then obviously we've lost the stability of the ecological function um, because we've lost too many elements and too many interconnections in the system. But then again, not all elements are, and species are created equally. Uh, again, this is where we've got the insight from keystone species, like for instance, beavers and cassowaries and, and the like, uh, which uh, have a significant influence on structuring their whole ecosystem and providing a habitat for a whole range of other, other passenger species to come along and live. And then those species become really important from a systemic uh, functioning perspective. So this is where we then look at diversity as, as a good attribute of, of a system and how the diversity provides this stability in system function. And then we can start talking about sustainability. And this is, this is to me a really good grounding of the term sustainability because there's various interpretations of the term. Uh, but to be clear here, sustainability is the stability of um, ecosystem or system function. And we can define what that function could be. It could be a climate stability, it could be food provision, it could be um, controlling inflation. We can, we can define that system function. And then uh, with the use of the system language, we can understand the system that we're looking at and work out what do we need, what kind of configuration do we need uh, to, to, to make that system work well and provide us those functions. So this is the challenge. Uh, in brief for our planners and managers is to work out whatever systems they are looking at, what attributes do they need, what configuration do we need them uh, to be able to, you know, at the end of the day, have sustainability as an emergent phenomena of, of uh, the system configuration and function. Um, so then uh, with, with that systemic understanding, we can inter interrogate a whole range of systems that we see around the world and, and one one of my pets is uh, the palm oil forests uh, that have replaced uh, the rich native forests in much of tropical parts of the world, um, mainly Asia. So it, it is a forest monoculture system. Um, again, we can look at you know what are its boundaries, what are its elements, not many, interconnections, few and far between, uh, and function and service. Some say palm oil production, others might say it's producing money and certain you know, control regimes around the world in terms of food system control, money control, and so on. Um, and what about stratified order? And this is where we're starting to get insights into the effect of all of this land use change on climate stability and planetary boundaries around the world, because those hierarchies are not working together. 
that the outcomes from this hierarchy are not contributing to the outcomes that we want at a, at a planetary level. And again, we can look at stocks and flows, diversity, resilience, and sustainability. So for me personally, coming from an ecological background, uh, I, 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 I was able to understand this intuitively and, you know, uh, and, and start working with it. But when I wanted to then extend it beyond to the economic system and the political system, that's where early on I found the work of David Harvey incredibly useful and, and powerful. So I make reference to three of his books here, um, which, which really helped me in this journey of taking my ecological background and interest into the political and economic realm. So um, in, in talking about systems, um, I've also got to say that there is a very strong tradition um, in business schools around the world um, where, where some of this thinking has been um, um, revolutionized. Like for instance, um, um, Russell Lakoff from Wharton, uh, from his 1974 excellent paper uh, on systems revolution, uh, where he talks about the change in age that we've gone from uh, enlightenment to the machine age, where we've understood the world as, as a mechanism, which we had to command and control. And that's what we do in environmental management is command and control. And what we're trying to do is shift that to, uh, to, to the language that suits our age, which is the systems age, uh, roughly from the 1940s, 40s, Aikoff says, um, but perhaps 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, where uh, a new understanding is a world as an organism with which we have to cooperate and communicate. And th that's also how we are starting to approach from an environmental management perspective, the world as an organism with which we have to cooperate and communicate. And uh, there's a footnote here in the sense that, uh, yes, the systems age is, is the hegemonic um, you know, shift in paradigm. Uh, but that is not to say that uh, the Aboriginal people or indeed some of the other cultures uh, around the world, like Taoism, have had this as their implicit worldview, the world as an organism, um, where you have these complex flaws and, and feedbacks and so on. Um, this is a bit of history of the systems age over the last 50 years mapped by Stefan et al. So they've, they've looked at key milestones in the progression of the systems age and uh, the work by James uh, Lovelock um, for the first time um, looked at the world as a, as a single super system and within which we have got all of these subsystems and, and so on. Uh, and then uh, uh, we started to develop a language to look at, uh, at or an indicator to look at the health of the super system and it's still being done daily. Most recent reading uh, is 414 parts per million and we should be under 350 parts per million in terms of climate stability. Um, and uh, much more recently in terms of planetary boundaries framework, which I'd be using uh, here and, 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 and for, my, for my presentation is uh, Rockstrom's uh, overview here. And, and this is still work in progress, for instance, um, we're still only working out uh, the issues we have with novel entities, and that includes plastic, microplastics. And that's a study that's still in, in its early stages. We've got so many issues at a, at a planetary level in that, in that context, and we're starting to map that at that scale as well. And, and much more recently, um, we are at a precipice, and that's the hothouse earth scenarios. So looking at scenarios, and if we continue to do business as usual, where are we going to end up uh, and so on. So all of this is embedded in the in that systems language and systems thinking. So in terms of economics, what I've found um, personally is um, Kate Roboth has done a really good job in bringing that within the uh, within the holistic framework uh, in, in this in this diagram here, uh, where she she's brought in Stefan's uh, and Rockstrom's uh, planetary boundaries framework and within that she's embedded uh, perhaps not directly, but in, in effect, uh, what is sustainable development goals in the middle here. Um, so we, we know that we, need, we have the means and the ends and, and the role of, of a healthy economic system is to provision uh, for those sustainable development goals within a livable planet. And that, that is again, that systems uh, thinking and systems language. Um, so that, that the systems language and what, what we saw here can, can be also looked at in a different way. And uh, this is um, uh, quite a, another useful way of looking at it, again, from Kate Raworth. 
um, where uh, we know we need to be within planetary boundaries. Uh, this is where GDP business as usual is taking us, has taken us for, for a very long time now. Uh, and what we are offered now in the mainstream is green growth. Um, but um, when we start looking at the literature, um, wherever we see there is not a strong evidence to suggest green growth is going to be enough uh, in terms of bringing us into the planetary boundaries limits. Um, you know, take, um, you know, alternative energy, take, uh, you know, lifestyle change and so on, which we've all encouraged to do, including on ABC. Um, car dependence, recently a really good paper by Matteo et al. looking at how we are still so dependent to our cars and fossil fuels. So that green growth argument hasn't gotten us very far and it doesn't look promising given all the research that's coming through. Uh, Jason Hickel and others are, are talking about degrowth and, and that degrowth is taking that even further. Uh, but perhaps even that is, is, is not enough. I don't know, that's still you know, work in, in progress uh, to be able to take us within those planetary boundaries because the, the changes that, that are happening to our ecosystems are already happening. And in some cases, we've already passed the thresholds, for example, for some of these plants here, which takes 200, 300 years to establish and reach their maturity. We've lost them, so we, we, you know, we, we're now behind in terms of reaching that climax systems again in our environment. So we, we've passed them already, or we, are, we, need, we need this change right now in terms of some of our systems. Um, so um, what, do, what do we do? And this is um, this, the next part of my talk is, um, so given, given that background, uh, I think we need to understand uh, why all of that's, that's been happening from a sustainable systems perspective, and then look, start looking at you know, what we can do to address that. Um, I, I quite like this uh, um, um, saying that you know, a large part of our solution is a careful or systemic definition of the problem. And this is a nice way of, of framing that problem in the sense that uh, we've got system structures and, and a lot of political economy is part of our system structures. And they're driven by mental models, how we think about, for example, debt and deficit and so on. Um, and, and that intent uh, ends up um, with certain design. And once we have the design, uh, then we obviously see the patterns of behavior that we see. A car dependence is another example here. Um, that you can, we can think of lots of different examples in this context. And I, I, it's interesting here, again, to think of uh, behavioral economics and what, what you know, Taylor and Sunstein call choice architecture. And this is choice architecture in the sense that uh, the people here are choice architects. They've, they've been the architects of the system that we have to work with, like, for instance, um, with car dependence. And obviously, that's created the patterns of behavior, fossil fuel dependence, and, and so on. So Johnson et al. goes so far as to say that there's no neutral architecture. Any way a choice is presented will influence how the decision maker chooses. There's, there's so much for consumer sovereignty. And this is again where um, I'm able to relate this to uh, conservation, where we are told again and again that this is what we have to do as ecologists to apply for funding for conservation. Um, but the question, you know, the question I wanted to ask, and Paul, Paul, Paul Boone and I asked in part of that paper, is that is that really the case? You know, can we dig into this a bit more deeply? Uh, you know, is there something else that's going on? What about the system structures that's driving these patterns, behaviors that we see in the context of conservation? Um, so I, I mentioned scarcity multiplier. This is uh, another interesting framework uh, to look at why we have these systemic issues. Um, so it, it might, this might look a bit complex, but uh, I'll use my pen here. Um, I can find pen, so. I can't find the pen, but hopefully you can see my mouse here. So that, that should work. Um, so we, um, we have wants and we have wants for both private goods and public goods. And those wants get translated into political decisions. Um, and the political decisions um, you know, provide for more development and that's part of GDP growth. And as we have more development and that encourages population growth and as population grows, we again need more private goods and public goods. And then the cycle goes on with more population growth. 
And as we have more development, there's also more consumption and more consumption leads to uh, positional competition when, when, and this is exacerbated by inequality when, when societies are highly unequal, there's a higher degree of positional comp competition. The, sta the status uh, um, Wilkinson and Pickett um, hypothesis here. Uh, and also adaptation is that over a period of time, uh, we get um, used to a certain standard of living and then we need, to, we need to seek for more private and public goods and that drives more development and so on. And, and obviously all of this is influenced by advertising, which, which drives positional competition and adaptation and feeds in through this cycle. And part of this is uh, this doesn't happen in a vacuum as within the planetary boundaries. And uh, this involves material throughput and the material throughput is uh, you know, the dilution of natural capital but for both private and public goods. And, and obviously we have a degree of uh, human capital infrastructure and financial capital. So what Paul, myself and Amy are trying to argue in, in this paper is that the dependence effect, uh, we bringing back Galbraith's dependence effect, the dependence effect and, and looking at the central role that the political decisions play in, in prioritizing private goods over public goods and on, the ongoing depletion of natural capital. And I think we tend to ignore this process and this feedback when we look at natural capital conservation. And I think we need to recognize this a bit more clearly. <clears throat> so um, so this is um, um, another framework that we are perhaps more familiar with, the Daly's uh, framework. Um, by Meadows here with this beautiful metaphor um, that uh, what, what economic systems try to do is through production and consumption um, connect um, um, the scarce means with uh, uh, human requirements or the ends. Um, but what's happened over time is um, that, uh, we, that we've, we've gotten into a production consumption trap as the scarcity multiplier previously argues and it's also part of Galbraith's um, um, argument in his 1958 book, um, and and this is this is also obvious uh, with our preoccupation with uh, GDP and to the extent that it doesn't measure consumption, let alone welfare, and and also the position um, we pro we give to consumption uh, in relation to production, um, and also how we treat producers around the world. And take India for example, where farmers are now on the streets uh, protesting for prices and, and, and so on. And, and obviously the natural environment is considered as an externality uh, in this equation here. Um, so what, what's this, this has done is uh, in terms of uh, human well-being, and this is, is an interesting um, survey, it's an ongoing survey by Gallup um, that, that looks at um, employee satisfaction. And uh, it's startling in the sense that um, um, something like one out of five people are, uh, just one out of five people are happy with their work and that's, that's a remarkable statistic. And David Greber theorized this as part of his bullshit jobs. And, uh, and you know, we can all also go back to Marx's um, um, formulation of universal alienation, which David Harvey has since um, talked about a lot in terms of how um, our daily life is deeply alienating in terms of this production consumption trap. And, and also the natural capital is now to the extent that we have so, so nostalgia um, that the environment that we've grown up around uh, is rapidly declining. Even in my uh, modest lifetime, that's the case, um, that we've lost a lot of the natural environment around us and we continue to do so. And that's driving us um, in, into a state of distress. Um, so uh, what can we do about it? So um, um, it comes back to the rules of engagement or in other terms, system design. This is about system structure and system design. Um, so what we've heard um, is, uh, at least in conservation, is that there's no alternative. It's the end of history. You've got to wear the straight jacket. You can't talk about it. It's out of bounds, out of public debate. Um, but all the same, we've, we've always had alternatives. Schumacher talked about the Buddhist economics in the 1970s. Again, at the same time, we had a steady state economics as, a, as an alternative. And more recently, we've had the modern monetary theory. And this is the prescriptive part, not the descriptive part as an alternative. And that's, that's what I want to touch on a bit more, the reminder of, of the talk. 
Um, so before I get into MMT a bit more here, I just wanted to make an interesting observation that um, historically, if we looked at the transition from post-war Keynesianism to neoliberalism in the 1970s uh, and what became key texts in, 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 that, in that transition uh, was this idea of, of freedom and, and the road to serfdom of, of, of how it is against freedom. Uh, and it's interesting that, that this was the foundation of the transformation that mobilized so many people in powerful positions uh, to, to take up this, these reforms. And it didn't happen because um, people wanted action on climate change or indeed wanted to protect nature. It was something deeply personal, something like freedom and a, an all encompassing idea. And that's an interesting thing to note in the sense that these systemic transformations um, I think need some all encompassing ideals uh, for them to come about. And I don't think it'll come about just because we wanted to protect climate or indeed protect that, that shrub that I was talking about early on. Uh, and in, in, yes, I mean, freedoms, yes, with the, with the footnote that, um, you know, they, they, they never mentioned the bad freedoms uh, as in relation to good freedoms. Um, but that's, that's the thing, isn't it? That uh, the language gets used in a certain way. Uh, but I'm encouraged to see uh, an, an, a reframing that's happening all around and sustainable prosperity is a, is a very good example of that reframing. And I think the reframing can go even further. And uh, this is where we, lo we look at in terms of planning and managing for sustainable systems is uh, we can think about reinventing daily life. Daily life has been changing over millennia. Uh, Right now, again, it's changing. Uh, it, it's different in different parts of the world. I grew up in a, in a country where daily life was completely different to what I am accustomed to right now. Um, and, and it should be up for question, what should daily life look like? And, uh, and there are some answers, uh, for example, David Holmgren's Retro Suburbia, where uh, they've offered an, a new version of, of daily life. And all of this is doable. I have some of this in back in my own house with limited support and imagine the amount of support that they can provide to these initiatives and how we can reconfigure uh, one home and one suburb at a time and achieve scale very, very quickly. And, uh, and there's a lot of literature that supports this kind of thinking and work, uh, literature around collaborative consumption, uh, how we're good at sharing and caring for others, um, and also some incredible work uh, in Melbourne uh, on, on degrowth. Um, so what, what, what we try to do in our um, course is look at it across the spectrum and say, well, um, students might be interested in any of these areas that they might want to work in. Uh, so we can look at consumption and within consumption, how, how can we reform consumption? We can talk about um, deep ecology. Um, we can talk about reform of advertising or eco-literacy. Uh, we can look at production and uh, circular economy is now gaining traction. Uh, but circular economy is is doesn't doesn't say you know if there's a steady state or 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 not and that's that's something that's an issue in terms of circular economy. So we can look at all of these things: cradle to cradle, eco efficiency. Uh, in terms of resources, we can look at eco certification, labeling, regenerative farm farming, uh, and so on. Uh, and there's lots of excellent case studies in all of this. Uh, one interesting point to note here is that. When I look at conservation legislation federally and at the state level, uh, we have conservation leg legislation that deals with production, um, like uh, EPA, for example, is one of their main areas. Uh, we have conservation legislation that deals with the resources, resource use and conservation. But I can't think of a conservation legislation that deals with consumption, consumption as an issue. And I think that's that should again be open for a question and discussion that uh, should we have conservation legislation that focuses on consumption as much as it focuses on production and, and resource use? Uh, the EPBC Act, for example, is completely silent on consumption, and I think it should be reformed to integrate consumption uh, within the, the national umbrella environmental legislation. Um, so um, I think the timing is also right uh, in the sense that uh, we've got we've got um, increasing issues of inequality wherever we look around the world. 
uh, and this is some um, data on that. Um, and uh, we are very close to what Marx famously said, nothing to lose but, but your chains. And, and this is uh, a, a potent mix along with solastalgia that many people are, are facing, including David Attenborough with his recent documentary and him crying at the end. And, and, and then people, you know, protesting on the streets in their own times. And, and that, that is a, a deep um, sentiment and emotion. And also, this is supported by um, lots of research, behavioral economics, and, and people like Lakoff offer, offer us a lot of insights which we didn't have before. Um, we've, we've had the global financial crisis. We've got the IPCC reports and, and also from biodiversity conservation reports and, and so on. And, and more recently, the global pandemic. And it is in this mix I also put MMT in, and I put two of the books that I found most useful, The Deficit Myth, obviously, but I've also found Bill's book uh, exceptionally good and useful, mainly because I think he goes further in, in talking about the important role of the state, that we need to reclaim the state in, in terms of um, um, the prescriptive part of MMT. We need a supportive state for that but also in terms of um, um, redesigning um, our structures and, and systems, not for tomorrow, but, but now, today. Um, so um, I'll, I'll touch on very quickly in conclusion um, uh, on Green New Deal, job guarantee, and the idea of reclaiming the state, because those programs offer us opportunities across all of these areas. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll use two of the examples that I'm currently working on. So take urban food production, for example. So we just finished off a, a survey of 300 people in Hobart looking at uh, what are their barriers and enablers for home food production. And what we've identified from that was a lot of people want to grow food at home. They identify a range of good reasons why they want to grow food at home, but there's very little support available for people to do it. And that includes time, infrastructure, support, and so on. Uh, so a simple thing like having three or four people employed by the local council who, who go out to help people understand what's involved in growing food at home and, and provide them one-on-one -on -one support will really help people grow more food at home. So there's, there's a few jobs in terms of job guarantee right there that actually provides for people's well-being as well as also produ producing where, where it really matters. Um, uh, where people are, and that's just schools. We can talk about school, uh, that's just homes. We can talk about communities and schools uh, and even community supported agriculture uh, and, and so on. So I'm, I'm putting this up because what it does is that it engages a part of uh, MMT in terms of aspects of Green New Deal and job guarantee, but also it goes to the core of what David Harvey talks about in terms of decommodification and looking at use values rather than exchange values, um, you know, who owns what and, and so on. So all of those contradictions Harvey talks about is captured in a program such as this. Um, so an, another, another aspect I want to talk about is um, um, on ecological restoration. Um, this is just, you know, some of the work that we, we've done in this space, but there's lots of work here and it's now globally well recognized, Josh Mombayo, uh, Greta Thunberg did a video on this uh, earlier this year, and now United Nations has accepted that it is indeed the new indicator of ecosystem restoration. And this is crucial because if you go back to parts per million, um, this is one way in which we can bring that down to 350 as soon as possible by rewilding our ecosystems. We we don't want to we don't want to graze cattle across the northern not northern parts of Tasmania those areas should be wetlands, they can be rewilded. We don't need milk, milk is a commodity just as petroleum and sugar, it's, it's commodified to, to the extent that you can't go to, go to a, a cafe and get anything without cheese in it, right? So that's to the extent that we've commodified cattle and, and dairy and in, in that process destroyed uh, wetland ecosystems. Dairy is the number one threat for wetlands in Tasmania. Uh, so, so through these two processes, we, we can um, retrofit uh, our systems so they're more sustainable um, into the future. So with that, I'll stop. I've also run out of time. 
and uh, I'll see if there are any comments or questions or I'm open for discussion. Thank you so much. Wow, so much in your talk. I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions. Um, shall we uh, stop the screen share so that we can see everybody? Ah, uh, there we go. Um, would anyone like to chime in? I'm also just starting to look at the chats. So. Mm -hmm. You can t feel free to take yourself off mute. Um, perhaps I might ask one. Oh, Barbara, would you like to? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Vishnu. That was a lot of um, information. And uh, what I was thinking about the gardening and the commodification of our food production and, and the commodification of our time um, and, and how you see um, the fact that people increasingly have to give their time to the sale of their labour, which makes it incredibly difficult to really see a mass movement to urban gardening or just, you know, gardening near our homes. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about time and the nature of people's lives. And I think that goes to the security of jobs too. If you don't know when your job's secure, it's really hard to also manage yeah. garden and domestic life. Yeah, no, that's definitely the case, Barbara. Uh, the the number one barrier that people reported uh, in terms of growing their own food was time, the lack of time. Not so much the money, but lack of time. Mm -hmm. And there were many comments uh, in our survey that said uh, that the pandemic was great for them <laughs> because they finally had the time to put in, put in a wedgie bed. I think that's a really interesting insight um, that we had this year about, you know, the, we, we all like to do these things and it, it, it's part of security for us as an activity to do with family, but we just don't have the time. And, and there are a number of initiatives and, and a couple that I really like is I think we need to do job sharing more. And mm -hmm. I'm a full-time academic and I'm overworked and I can see a lot of PhD students coming through the system and I can easily share some of what I'm doing with them but that it, it's incredibly hard for me to do that now. The systems are so complex and the finance person sitting somewhere, this is where the hierarchies in the universities are incapable of dealing, dealing with that. Mm. Um, I think we, we, we need to do job sharing more where, um, where I can uh, decommodify some of my, like, I mean, I, I'm growing a thousand, thousand five hundred dollars worth of food. Now, if I had more time, I could, you know, grow 2003. I mean, I could grow most of my food at home, which I re really would like. And, and I think th uh, that's, that's a key part of it. I think, I think that that's also why the UBI has that appeal because people see that UBI is an opportunity for them to go and do all of these things that I've always wanted to do, grow a veggie garden or learn guitar. And, and I think that's what um, I think JG job guarantee would have to think about a bit more in terms of, you know, that alienation is that how can J job guarantee not be alienating for people mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, how, how can we make it more meaningful? And yeah. We've got two questions in the chat. I'll start with Jane. Um, Jane says, thank you. It looks doable from the info you presented, but how do we get the political will? The million dollar question, hey. Um, those currently in power love business as usual. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a really good, important question, but I, I think if I reframe this, this in systems language, um, in systems language, we can't control the outcomes. We can control the processes. So the process that I can control is to, to research this, talk to people about it, inform my students about it, and, and, and the, process, the outcomes will be the outcomes. So. And I think if we focus more on the process, put flat out, uh, I think the outcomes would emerge over, over time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, we could also take comfort from history that, you know, like people couldn't have seen progress at an earlier time, but when progress did happen, it did happen. And that happened because of all the things that were building up up to then. So I, I look at it that way. So then I, I, that helps me in, stay energized, do what I'm doing while not getting hung up on the outcomes. 
Yeah. I guess it's a matter of using our, our time and resources in the most strategic way. Yeah, that, that's, that's, a good, that's a good discussion to have is uh, what is the best uh, application of our limited time? Yeah. And, and this has been one of my arguments with uh, ecologists and conservationists is that uh, we can publish a whole range of papers about conservation and policy, but it's not going to go very far unless we deal with the political economy and the politics of it. So mm -hmm. it was a personal choice for me to get into this, even though I was learning on the run and I'm still learning on the run, but, uh, uh, but this is where I want to be in terms of the, uh, where we are uh, uh, with, with the planetary boundaries. Um, there's a question from Stephen, but I might go to um, Tim first. He's got his hand up. Yeah, thanks, Gabby, and thanks, Vishnu. I really enjoyed the um, presentation. Um, I guess I'd like to follow up on Jane's question or ask it in a slightly different way. Um, you did a really good description, a really good work on how complex systems work together or don't work together, as the case may be that we can only understand the world in terms of systems rather than rather simple processes. Um, my question comes back to a number of the things you've talked about, which I absolutely like myself. We have a garden where we try to travel locally, we exchange with our neighbours. Um, we've got a house that is um, environmentally uh, built to be env and low environmental impact. Um, we can all do those things, but they're not actually affecting the system. These are people busily doing what they can locally to do to minimise their own impact. So if complex systems are generally non-linear, that means that there should be points of pressure where if you push, you get a much more um, extensive result, have much more impact than if you just push everywhere, um, satisfying yourself, but not actually changing the system. So my question is from your, your looking at political and ecological systems, have you identified um, any points of leverage where um, a relatively small effort uh, would, would yield significant results? And I'll frame it in the context that, again, we're hearing just how much we know about how the world operates, but very little of it seems to be percolating into, into political decision making. So um, how does that happen at <laughs> the point of leverage? Yeah, so um, 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 it's, a, it's a very good question. And uh, this goes back to Donna Lameto's leverage points. She had a list of nine leverage points of increasing importance. And uh, the most important leverage point is uh, changing basically the culture. So if the culture has changed, then everything changes. Uh, and, and the lowest one is, um, you know, changing your light bulb and, and things like that. Um, so the way I've looked at it is that um, we need to work across the spectrum in terms of all of those leverage points. Um, and the issue, one of the issues is that we tend to focus on the lower end of the leverage points and not strive hard enough to get the higher end of the leverage points. Um, so what I would say is to work across the spectrum on all of those leverage points. Uh, so students ask me this question. So I know I've, I've tried to reflect. Um, I mean, it's hard to think in terms of the future, but I've thought about my own past where I worked closely on wetland conservation in Tasmania. And I've asked myself over the last 10 years, we've achieved a lot in wetland conservation in Tasmania. So what were the leverage points that led to those outcomes? And uh, when I asked that question, I... I mean, there's, there's, it's all over the place. There's so many different things that that's influenced that. And sometimes, you know, I get someone call me and say, look, I, I came to your talk two years ago. I've since bought a property. We've got a salt marsh in the property and I want to protect the salt marsh. And I mean, those are the things that we, we couldn't expect that to happen, but it's happened in the end. Again, so that's where, that's where I, I'm, I'm looking at it across the spectrum and I'm looking at how we can, activate as many leverage points as we can. Um, if that answer is not satisfactory, Tim, and I, I can refer to um, one of the other um, speakers on the sub subject, Sina, he did a talk and, uh, and the same question was asked and um, he, his answer was two things. Uh, one 
is to change the politics. So in, get engaged in politics and change. If we change the politics, then uh, it can happen really quickly. Um, we can see change quickly. And the other one was uh, be involved in be involved in local groups, meaningful local action. So that, those were his two main uh, leverage points. So that when we have local action and and the the politicians are seeing what's happening locally and seeing what's working locally. And then they are energized, energized by it and they can show them as examples. And we've got the right people to then market that more broadly at a higher scale. Those were his two main ideas, which I, which I quite like and I'm happy to relay that on. As if, if we wanted to think of two main leverage points, I, I, I think that those are the two, but more generally, I think we, we should work across the spectrum. There's a lot in the chat at the moment. Um, shall I, if, if we just scroll back a little bit, there was a, a conversation in the chat there about um, benefits and um, benefits of a, base, a basic income guarantee in terms of free time uh, against a job guarantee. Um, would you, do you have any comment on that? Was, uh, where, where, was, where was this, Gabby, sorry? Yep. Oh, in the, just in the chat, what, what, I'm summarizing a little, I'm summarizing. I, oh, I, what, is it from Stephen? Uh, yes, yeah, Stephen, David, Jacob. Oh, yeah, yeah. So do you still think people are ill-informed about some of the science of system breakdown? Uh, yeah, uh, we missed may, that, that question. Make it optional and combine with the guarantee. Um, yeah, so there's, there's still a lot of, um, um, lack of understanding of um, system background break, breakdown that's that's happening, and and also I think it's very hard for people to relate to it in a meaningful way, and I I can relate to wetlands because I see them regularly and they're my friends, but I can't expect uh, Stephen to think of wetlands the same way as I uh, I do, um, and and in, in that respect uh, maybe I can't relate to some of the other things that people are more close to. So I think this is the trouble we have again and again that, um, that I, I want to say in one of my talks uh, with the ABC that uh, I think we are doing a disservice if we are promoting our favorite species too much <laughs> because um, it, it's effectively, I mean, yeah, so if we, if we get all, our, all the koalas conserved, then uh, what about the insects? What about mm -hmm wetlands in Tassie. So I think we we need to have a conversation about, and people are interested in conservation, you know, 2021, what are, what are going to be our main priorities? I mean, it can't be koala conservation, really. I mean, 2021 yeah. is a job guarantee. Everyone across the board is going to push for it because once we get that on board, I think we can fix wetlands um, I've, I've, I've just spoke to uh, um, an ecosystem restoration expert in Northeast Tasmania, and he was telling me how um, he, he takes all troubled kids in the community and they come to him and they spend a week with him and they do ecosystem restoration. And it, it really has a tremendous impact on them, on their mental health and so on. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's great for me as well in Tasmania that I feel safer uh, with with people who are actively engaged in, in meaningful work like that, so um, so I think that's that's a conversation that we're not having and we should have in the sense that um, we 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 should pull together and agree on you know what are the, what are those priorities going to be for this year and how are we going to mo mobilize to get that through. Um. There's some great comments also in the chat um, about the impacts of unemployment on people's well-being. Um, I wonder if I could actually ask a question myself, which is thinking about um, not only stopping uh, putting carbon into the air, but actually taking carbon out of the air. What, um, what are the best and most effective ways do you know of that this could be supported? Um, with, with, uh, well, with the work we do, the first thing is to stop any more um, of high carbon rich ecosystems. And we're still doing that. Hmm. 
Um, and, uh, and number two is to restore them wherever we can. And, uh, and, and uh, for the first time, we now have got $350,000 to um, restore some wetlands around Southern Tasmania. And that was after a long period of work and, and finding out what works for funding institutions. But um, we, we need to do landscape restoration at scale and uh, in some areas, uh, we, we have farmers who have stopped farming the property. In, in one example, uh, the farmer, I'm actually going to the farm tomorrow, the farmer stopped putting the sheep on the farm because it's too marginal. It's just sitting there waiting to be restored, but we just don't have the money yeah. uh, to do it. And, uh, and that's, that's, <laughs> where, that's, that's where I think uh, MMT, I, I come back to say, okay, well, we've got to put these things together and, and make it make it happen. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. We've got a question from Michael. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks for putting this together, by the way. Look, I think in all of this productivity is probably the, the most important thing of all. And how do we actually go about aligning um, economic benefits with environmental benefits? Are there any low hanging fruit? Uh, is there a proof of concept? I'm thinking um, in terms of you know, farmers tilling their soil, you know, just dry sowing it has proven very effective. We're getting to solar becoming cheaper than having, having the generators and maintaining a network. Like, is, is there some sort of low-hanging fruit that we could prove, you know, proof of concept? Um, the, the, yeah, like, apart from the examples that you mentioned, Michael, um, fisheries is, an, is a great example. Um, wild catch fisheries, there is still a, a great demand for wild catch fisheries around the world. And uh, they are dependent on wetlands. And uh, by restoring wetlands at scale, we are ensuring wild catch fisheries into the future. And that is uh, productivity um, that, you know, for future fishermen and for food production. And also not to mention the carbon sequestration that happens and the biodiversity gains the out of um, and again, from my work, I could say that urban food production is another great example that relocalizing food production. And uh, um, I, I've, I have students who often say that they don't want to go and work as a planner with rubber stamping developments. They like to work with their soil. Um, and all they want is um, $50,000 a year. They're happy to work their hearts out in producing food in an urban farm. But mm -hmm we're not providing those opportunities for them. And, uh, and, and that then, uh, we know from other parts of the world how urban food production provides values in terms of local restaurant trade, um, yeah, you know, where uh, increasing uh, food availability, um, especially what is now called as food deserts. And, mm. and it also reduces um, expenditure in terms of health and um, well-being and so on. It's great exercise gardening, <laughs> as most yeah. of us know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I read somewhere that Russia does very well with this, like more than half of their food is produced in small local and um, people's own household uh, kitchen gardens. I don't know if that's correct. Yeah. Um, I did see it yeah. on Facebook, but... <laughs> Look, I have Russian Ukrainian heritage and I can attest to that even though they've all passed on now. But if you went back to an urban backyard in the, the 80s or 90s and found yourself someone from Eastern Europe, mm. the, the backyard is it's built for, for that sort of thing. There's always the chalks and it's just a cultural thing. They love it. And, um, you know, even my mother-in-law who's Ukrainian goes mad if she's away from her garden. It's, it's a meditation for her. Mm. I think that's um, common across many cultures. Sadly, not um, our Aussie, mainstream Aussie culture. Um, do we have uh, anybody else with a burning question? Yes, yeah, Stephen, go ahead. Um, you're not on mute, but we can't hear you. I'm sorry. Should 
Try again. No, sadly, we can't hear you. Okay, maybe do you want to type it in, in the chat? Alex has a question, go ahead. Conversation this evening, Vishnu, very informative. When you say political action um, at all levels from council up? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, councils are, are, are very responsive to local community needs. And uh, when we did our food work, and um, even now doing the food work, um, Hobart City Council is actually leading this. And uh, what they have done is, and this is just one person, one good person in Hobart City Council, mm -hmm. he's mobilized the whole council and now he's set up a working group that's brought in even state government people. And now the state government people are saying, look, this is great. We would like to do this. This is an opportunity for us to um, do COVID recovery. And, uh, and there's, there's something in it for everyone, uh, including for the Bunnings and Mitertons of the world. Uh, because when we did our surveys and Bunnings and Mitreton came out as um, uh, places that people go to look for information or resources, and uh, some people reported as a barrier as how far their home is from a Bunnings and Mitreton. So <laughs> uh, I think this is this is something that I think if we pitch it well, something in it for everyone, and uh, it's it's a low hanging fruit. Well, that's like the climate emergency declaration. There's studies showing that if that can get done at local, then it has an impact on state and federal. Yeah, and I think we're seeing that already. Even up to global, there's a um, call for a global climate emergency declaration at the moment, which we're following with interest. Um, I wonder about growing food in uh, increased urban density. So like in... I mean, I know it's possible in, uh, you know, flats and apartments and, and high-rise living. Um, do, do, can you think of any examples that we can look to that, that have started to do this really well? Um, I was surprised to see that uh, there's now a lot of kits available for people to grow food indoors. And, uh, and that wasn't the case a few years ago. Um, and uh, I think there's more options currently um, available people to start doing that and even on gardening australia we've we've had a special um the last few weeks on uh, indoor plants mm. and coming coming after covid so i think again i think this is where the the market could, could work really well if there's a sufficient demand for it i'm sure there would be um people who come up with solutions and cater for that great question from kathy um she says she's been wondering if with more people wanting to work from home permanently, offices in cities could be turned over to food production. Yeah, definitely. And, and this is again an insight from systems is that I think, um, think of all of our places as multifunctional and uh, we've, we've, we've been so inefficient in terms of how we use our resources where uh, we use our homes as uh, as a cubby hole to sleep, and then our workplaces as the place to work. Um, and then if we need recreation, we need to go somewhere else. Um, and, and I think we've got to shift, and this is what Retro Suburbia is arguing, is that um, a home become a part, a central part of our lives and our economic activity. Um, and, 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 and already that shift is happening, for example, with energy generation. Um, people are generating their own energy um, for all sorts of reasons and using batteries, so they're becoming prosumers. So food is is in similar. You know, we we don't use the word prosumer with food, but there's no reason why we can't, because uh, we produce and we consume, and uh, and that cycle happens really at a, at a, a local scale. So yes, I I, I definitely agree that uh, I think we need to when we retrofit our environments and thinking about reproducing our daily lives, we need to think of multifunctional um, homes, multifunctional urban, multifunctional offices and so on. Um, any more questions? I'm, I'm looking at the chat to see if I've missed anything. There's a lot there. I was wondering if we could circle back to um, employment and just uh, touch back on the um, the mental health aspects of 
um, of being uh, able to access meaningful work. So, um, I've, from what I've um, seen and heard in Tasmania, that would be a really um, powerful um, system change if we could get get that. Um, and I've, um, yeah. So I, I think this is something that I should probably also defer to someone who's thought about it a bit more than I have in terms of uh, the job guarantee as a program and its potential benefits. So even if Stephen's there, I could ask him if he wanted to add anything or if anyone else wanted to um, add something to it. But uh, one of the things I wanna do is um, really push that forward in, in, in TASI, but also in the broader conservation literature um, where that becomes a key part of um, what we try to do with conservation. I think we may have lost Stephen momentarily. Yep. Um, there's a question about uh, water use as well. Um, I think uh, Kip's asked about sustainability of using water to grow gardens in a dry city like Adelaide. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, well, there's lots of tricks uh, that we could, we could use to minimize um, or completely exclude water use and uh, um, again, you know, I'll, I'm referring back to what I've seen on Gardening Australia to come up with ideas. It is possible. Um, and uh, um, I, 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 this goes back to what we were hearing from people is that um, um, people wanted to do things, but uh, in many cases, they didn't know what they didn't know. Um, that, and, and this is where I think experts could help. Um, and we've got experts who have figured all of this out. Mm. And if we can, if we can connect them, people who want this help, and the experts could provide that help. Um, and and the market system has been ineffective because of the huge transaction costs. People need to, you know, I've been trying to call a plumber for a whole week. I haven't had two minutes to do it. So, mm. you know, for all the talk about efficient markets, I think there's a lot of uh, transaction costs involved in in leaving it to the market. So I think this is where, I think if we did it uh, with the councils, just as we, I mean, we don't, we don't have to worry about uh, green waste now. You just, you know, when you, you have to put it out, you put it out and there's transaction cost is almost zero in that case. So I think it's gotta be built in into that efficient mechanism where, um, you yeah, know, it's, uh, it's, it's done at a local scale and done efficiently. I think you're absolutely right about about the, um, the skills involved in gardening and actually um, making, planting things at the right time, planting the right things. Like there's nothing worse than pouring your heart into a tomato plant and it just dies when it's too hot or, you know, yeah. the possums eat it or, you know, it, setbacks can be really disheartening. But if you've got um, people there to help and support you, I think mm. that would be really what? helpful. One of the interesting findings we had was um, we found that there was a threshold effect that when people grew things for over five years, grew a lot more. So I, I think that time is when people have all these trial and error and then finally work out a formula that works for them. Yeah. And yeah. local knowledge as well. So important. Mm. Mm. But, but all of that can be facilitated. And, and that's, that's where... Um, um, yeah, a, a, a Green New Deal, a JG kind of a case could be made that uh, this is something that people really want to do. There's demand for it. It benefits, uh, you know, our local suppliers. Um, and uh, we just have to put all of those things together. And, uh, yeah. and also it ties in with what people are learning, uh, what children are learning in school. Like so many mm. schools have these programs and to have that reinforced by ha having it happen at home would be just so wonderful. Is that Jacob's garden? Um, I, oh, thanks, Jacob. Awesome. Barbara, did you have a hand up there? I did, I did. I just wanted to come back to um, employment. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and, and the sort of, um, 
differences between the job guarantee and the UBI. And for me, um, and I've done my life was really about researching work and employment issues. And I, I think what's really important, whether you're going to be UBI or job guarantee oriented, is we need mechanisms to allow people to transition between states. And that's what's really important. And that and that's what sick leave does. That's what long service leave does. That's what parental leave does. It it creates moments and paid moments, most importantly. Um, to, to move in and out of the labour market. And my research showed that actually a lot of Australians find a lot of meaning through their paid work, whether they're low income or high income. Yep. Um, I also felt a bit that like, you know, this is more than three quarters of people would tick a box to say, uh, I find my work very meaningful. And when you interviewed them, they'd say, I really like doing a good job when I clean um, the mirror in the toilets or whatever. So I think we, we've, we've got into the habits of commodification. We find meaning in them that's a bit habitual, but we need to have mechanisms that allow people to move in and out of the labour market um, rather than be um, reifying paid work as the only way to exist. I think that's a problem for me with the job guarantee, unless we take a very broad definition of work. Caring, unpaid caring, which is increasingly affecting many of us with ageing population, has to be part of the picture. And artwork and a whole bunch of other non-commodified activities. Mm. Good good um, yeah. summary. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. No, I think that's, uh, yeah, definitely the case. And I've uh, had personal experiences of that. Um, um, you know, you know, Bill says you meet your partner at work and I did <laughs> as well. So, <laughs> and uh, there's lots of things that happens with work that, uh, yeah, that, that we tend not to factor in when we, yeah, but, but yeah, I, I, the, the, the thing is we don't, we don't want to reproduce universal alienation with the JG. I think that's, that's, you know, I, I think it's, it's gotta be, it's got to be solution for alienation and un unalienating meaningful work. Um, yeah. So it's, it is a, I've, I've struggled with thinking about that as well in terms of what would work well, but I think any, any, uh, any anything could work as a good experiment compared to what, what we have now as well. So. Absolutely. And I think as Stephen has said before, when we went to meet some, some union um, reps recently, you know, we don't have bullshit schools. We don't have bullshit hospitals. Those things are still in public hands. Mm. So, um, you know, we, we shouldn't give up on the idea of jobs, a job guarantee that doesn't consist of bullshit jobs, if you know what I mean. Am I, am I making a noise yes, now? go for it. Yeah. I've had a bullshit job. A bullshit job. Uh, it, it, it contributed nothing to society. So I think there are lots of bullshit jobs. There's plenty of people in my university that are doing bullshit jobs. Exactly. Pointless. Just, they may as well not be there at all. And they know it as well. And some of them are quite highly paid um, too. But yeah, I, I think it's really important. And I, disagree, I think I disagree with Bill on this, but I think I'm in the majority on the MMT side, not the minority. I think it's important that there is a guaranteed minimum income, an unconditional minimum income, not a universal one. I'm not, I'm not, I just think it's, it's ridiculous to pay it out to billionaires and then take some of it back in tax. Um, and I don't think you'll ever sell that to people. But no. I do, I believe in uh, New Start or Job Seeker or whatever you want to call it being uh, apart from the fact it's mean tested, being unconditional. I don't think there should be uh, mutual obligations or obligations to seek a number of jobs and add a job guarantee as well. And then if you don't want to be part of the job guarantee because you don't derive meaning from it, then if you've got a non-poverty basic income payment as an alternative, you don't have to participate. That's, that's my view. Yeah, as an outsider, Stephen, uh, one of the thought processes that I've always went through in terms of thinking about what would work is um, uh, I've always been amazed by how um, the whole airport system works 
you know, people wake up at two o'clock in the morning to get to their work and they do all sorts of really, you know, things to get planes on the, you know, to fly and get us to places. So if we didn't have the current model of jobs, would that still work? What would be the incentive be for people to wake up at two o'clock in the morning and go and clean aeroplane toilets? You'd have to pay oh, them. Is, yeah, okay. Yeah. You'd have to pay them properly and maybe you'd have to pay more to get on the plane. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so, but that's maybe, fair enough. Yeah. Maybe some more of that would be automated away and that really is uh, not the most attractive of job to have to do. And if you can automate away some of those jobs, great, because we've got more important, more interesting yeah. things that we can offer people to do. And as I said, I, I, I think there should be a basic income. I think if people were guaranteed that when they wanted to work, they could find paid employment that was worthwhile, I think a lot of people would take time off and come back to it. Mm. Uh, I think you could have people working fewer hours a week if they were guaranteed they could get the hours that they wanted to get. Mm -hmm. I think we could transition to have shorter working lives. I think it's extraordinarily important that we don't divide up our population in the future, which there's every sign of us doing if we're not careful, into those of us who are fortunate enough to have decent paid jobs if we want them and those who are excluded. And where I do go along with Bill is I think we need to avoid um, turning people into consumption machines where they're not given the right to participate in paid work if they want to they're excluded from it and they are instead paid a, a pittance just to allow them to subsist so basic income yes um job guarantee yes choice between the two false choice it's not a choice you have to make to, to address Stephen um Vishnu's question as well if in fact there is say a, a jobs guarantee and also some basic income underpinning that for the people who don't want to work, then the answer to your question is that if, if you want somebody to work for you, you will have to make it attractive. Yeah. That would yep. not be a bad dynamic to have in our society, mm. where if you wanted somebody to give you their time in order for you to make money, for you to, then the job has to be made attractive and you have to then think about how do I attract yep. people? Mm. And shit yep. jobs will attract good money. Yeah, that's, 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 and, yeah. and many jobs will be made interesting because you'll have to think about i've got to attract people here i think it's a very different dynamic in society the 1960s in london was a bit like that there was full employment there were far more vacant jobs than there were people looking for them that was the world my sisters left school and went into because uh, they're rather older than me very different world to the one we used to it's the same here. It was the same here, Stephen. And look, could I just say for comment, I agree absolutely, but I think we also need to reflect on, and we've touched on it, is that it's, it's certainly got to be a key choice for people to be able to participate in meaningful work if they can and have a safety net of a decent, bloody, basic living wage if they can't. But the reality is people will move in and out because we're talking about a lot of people who are at the margin, who mm. are, you know, experiencing abuse, violence, homelessness, addiction, mental illness, et cetera, et cetera, disability, and, you know, um, constrained circumstances which limit their ability to engage in the traditional way that we think that labour market needs to operate. And we need to adjust our labour and industrial system and our welfare system to accommodate that. Mm. And it's not that, it sounds pie in the sky, but oddly, I lived in Tasmania in the 80s. I saw, I, for the first year and a half I was there, I did productive things, growing gardens, building houses, learning permaculture. I was on unemployment benefits and I saw someone every six months. Mm. And the rest of the time I sent my form back. And, you know, there was, and so it was a whole cultural change as well. But could I also just ask a question very quickly? I mean, right. one, a lot of what you're talking about, the local level, interestingly enough, there was a foundation of it in Tasmania through Bill Mollison et al called Permaculture, which essentially mm -hmm. derived from concepts from Japan and North America, notwithstanding. But 
earlier on, you said about key factors that sustain systems, Vishnu, and that was, mm -hmm. you know, both the sort of volume, and, you know, both quantity and quality example, i.e. Bs, if they, you know, in terms of quant quantity drop below a certain level, um, you know, it's diabolical system collapse, but also there are key system participants that shape their ecology or environment substantially. And you exemplified beavers and cassowaries, I think. Mm, mm. Now, in a sense, there's a political analogy there. Yep. Um, but if you take a sort of reductive rather than inductive view, where, you know, where, where politically and in those kind of environments do we most strategically engage to prevent and preserve and maintain foundations upon which can be rebuilt upon? Because, you know, it isn't a matter of building small systems in complete ways in some senses. It's that, mm. you know, what you're really exemplifying is the whole of our fucking, sorry, the whole of our ecology is, is collapsing. Yep. Yeah. So whether it be forests, whether it be water, whether it be land degradation, whether it be air quality, whether it be global warming, whether it be biodiversity, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where do we strategically intervene? And it is, it, you know, and, and would you make a distinction between that quantity and quality analogy, i.e. bees versus beavers? <laughs> Question of the year, that wins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, Paul, you, you've reminded me of something else in the sense that uh, one of the issues we have, at least in regional Tasmania, and this is common across other parts of Australia, is where we have unsustainable industries uh, that create a lot of externalities, we s still continue to support them politically because of the jobs involved, i.e. the warts involved. But if we did have a job guarantee program um, or some of the, uh, or a similar nature, that would help us transition more quickly and reduce the effective social cost because you know they can always walk out of you know, a job as a forester or a miner into another job that socially we've recognized as the way forward. Um, and, and I think that's also holding us back in in instance, us you know reminded by your comment there. Uh, so in terms of the political process, um, my colleague Paul Smith, uh, who I'm working on scarcity multiplier, he's written a book on the subject called Rescuing Democracy, um, published by Punctum Books, uh, where he's considered that very question, uh, but at a much greater depth than I had um, given it thought. Uh, so he looks at various systems around the world in terms of how democracies work or, or not work. Uh, so what he's then finally landed on is uh, what is called as a people's forum. Uh, it's a form of deliberative democracy and there are versions of this like citizen juries, um, but those are minimal um, and only some progressive councils tend to use it as a way of collaborative decision making. And I've been involved in a few with Hobart City Council and they do a really good job. They probably don't call it citizen juries, but it's very collaborative in terms of how they come up with their strategies and, and decisions. Uh, and I think if we can um, increase public participation uh, in, in that, provide people an incentive to be involved in the public participation process. Uh, it could be an economic incentive or it could be in the form of a disincentive that if you don't participate, decisions might be taken that might not conform to what you might have wanted. Um, and, and if we can design a, a system that provides people, that doesn't have to be A1, but if it's a representative sample that others are happy that that sample represents them, then I think uh, that could be a way of uh, taking, taking it away from politicians um, because of all the issues that we have with politics right now with um, the lack of a corruption watchdog and political donations and and uh, carrier politicians and, and so on. Thank you, Vishnu. Yep. I might I might just add that um, you know the other the positive side of um, the barriers are and you know that we should be emphasising as well is the social ca social capital and social inclusion yep. that comes from employment and. I guess it's also a conversation about the circumstances that enable the, you know, the domestic 
economy to flourish or domestic production as well because our communities used to be full of domestic production whether it was sharing care of children whether it was fixing each other's broken down motor cars or push bikes or whatever it was where it was you know jointly exchanging vegetables and seeds and god knows what and it's about the circumstances that and Tasmania is the best place to do that, actually. Yeah, it is, so, uh, yeah. Anyhow, thank yeah. you. <laughs> a couple of, couple of people I work with, um, Hannah Maloney, who's on Gardening Australia. So she talks about how we need a reskilling revolution for that. And that's part of retrofitting and reinventing daily life is where we reskill ourselves in, in uh, teaching ourselves a lot of these things where we do produce and production is a very joyful process uh, once we gain a certain level of expertise in it and uh, and and that brings us joy that that in our traditional work might not be able to provide given the limited nature it's only so much joy you can derive from writing a paper or taking a class but uh, mm -hmm. growing a good zucchini is a, is a something else it's out of thin air yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Even me, who is incredibly time poor, has done that and, and loved it. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of an invention, it's an act of invention. Um, and, and that's, yeah, but reconnects us. How to cook it. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that, that too. Yeah, and that, that adds to that yeah, invention too. Yeah. Well, we've, we've gone on past our 8.15 um, uh, winding up time quite a long way, but gee, it's been such a good discussion. Um, I'm wondering, uh, would people like to stay another five or so minutes and, and um, brainstorm some ideas for what kind of talks they'd like to hear next year? Or shall we call it a night? Um, let's go, wave at me for another five minutes. Yeah, sort of, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's, let's stay a little bit longer. Um, um, but first, before we, um, before we move into that, I would love to thank Vishnu so much for talking to us tonight. And I hope we will um, be able to get your slide presentation too, because that was so detailed. And if I could send that out to people that can have a close look at some of those diagrams, uh, especially the, the black um, background one, which I was just yep. looking at and thought, I'm going to need at least 10 minutes to. <laughs> yeah, S sorry, sorry. Well, <laughs> no, I don't apologize. Yeah, but, uh, it's really yeah, good. such a good resource. Yeah, no, I'd love to have some feedback on that. It's uh, good to hear that from you guys as the reviewers. So. Would we be able to email it around if you send it to me? Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. Great. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Would you like to stay for our um, uh, um, idea session or do you need if to? You, if you don't mind, I'd like yeah. to, yeah. Stay in chat. You're most welcome. So, thank you. Let's do a round of applause. <laughs> if it was your birthday, you. we'd, we'd sing, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> we did that last Zoom talk. We should, we should send him a tea towel. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> you have a tea towel too? Uh, we have greens tea towels. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. With, um, um, uh, Scott Ludlam and Bob Brown. I'll send you Bob Brown. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I, I know Bob will. And uh, yeah, I'd love to yeah, have one. Thank you. There I was going to send Stephen uh, one of our wetland birds tea towel for his talk, so we'll exchange tea towels. That sounds great. <laughs> We've also got um, uh, a, sh a uh, parcel arriving soon with Jason Hickel's book, which I've been waiting a good six to eight weeks for. Um, so really excited to get a few copies of that. Um, which um, you'd be most welcome to borrow a copy if you don't have access to that already. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to actually get a personal copy. Yeah, yeah, so I'd be keen to, yeah. Yeah, they take a while yep. to come through, that's all. Okay, so, yeah. Sure. Um, and the other book that we're looking out for early next year is um, Scott Ludlam is working on a book at the moment too called Full Circle about power and um, 
movement. So that should be really good for yeah. democracy. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, all right, I might just uh, stop the recording there. I've gone a little bit too long with that. So um, thank you very much and we'll hit stop.